three, two, <clears throat> one. Hello, this is John Carroll again with Forward Talk. Thank you for taking the opportunity to watch this episode. And today we have a very special guest with us, Pastor Tony Suarez. Uh, first of all, uh, Tony, I hope it's okay to call you Tony. Absolutely. I'm thank glad you. To be thank you for doing this. Thank you for being a part of this. Uh, for those of my viewers that don't know uh, who Tony Suarez is, uh, first of all, you need to pray through. Um, <clears throat> Just kidding, but he is an incredible preacher, uh, has, a, has a tremendous uh, resume. He is the executive vice president of the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference, and they have, uh, according to your bio here, uh, over 40,000 churches in, in the United States that, that you guys oversee. Can you tell us just a little bit about um, what, what you guys do, what, what the uh, function of that of that uh, group is? Absolutely. You know, the NHCLC was born out of a vision that God had given uh, Pastor Sam Rodriguez when he was a teenager. And it really, the, it came out of this desire to marry Martin Luther King's march with Billy Graham's message. And what we meant by, and what we mean by that is uh, it's not so much a doctrinal point as much as in, in that era, there were those that were marching for social issues and then there was those that were preaching um, gospel messages or the evangelical message but the two camps didn't really cross so what if you could what if you could build a movement that did cross that had as as pastor sam explains that both the vertical and the horizontal plank of the cross vertical meaning our relationship with god and horizontal being the relationship that we have with our brother and sister realizing that the strongest part of the cross is the nexus. It's the connecting point of the vertical and the horizontal. What if we could direct Christians to be that nexus of the cross, to be both vertical and horizontal, love God and love our neighbors. And so the NHCLC was born, Pastor Sam being of Puerto Rican uh, descent. Um, it started as a Hispanic movement. It grew and at this point is now the largest Hispanic Christian organization in the world. And but as it's grown and its influence has grown, it's become much more than just a Hispanic movement. It really encompasses everybody. However, being uh, fair and honoring to our heritage, we've always called it the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference, but it obviously has transcended just being in the, in the Hispanic world. And so I've walked with Pastor Sam from the church house to the White House. He's been a consultant for four different presidents or an advisor for four different presidents. And through that, He's opened door for many others. I started working with him nine years ago as a volunteer, and he took a chance on me, trusted me, and um, I started overseeing our chapters around the United States and eventually became the executive vice president. It was through Pastor Sam that I was afforded the opportunity to have our program on TBN and also to uh, be an advisor to President Trump, uh, being a part of the Evangelical Advisory Board. So I give him a lot of honor and a lot of respect because he, he has had a huge, a tremendous impact on who I am and what I'm doing today. And I think it's important that we always honor those that open the doors. And I, you know, my, my cheesy preacher saying is that gratitude is the perpetual door to more. If you'll stay grateful and honoring of those that did it and never, never get to that point where you think I'll open that door. The moment you say I'll open the door, it's almost like God's hand says, Oh really? Then try this next one. Let me see. Yeah, exactly. Open. open this one. If you're so good at it, But if you'll stay grateful and thankful and honoring God will just, he'll just send more doors and more people. And so that's my, uh, that's my story in a nutshell over the last nine years. So what about, what about your personal story that made you interested or uh, gave you the desire, the passion to even to become involved in this particular aspect of, of ministry? Well, part of it has to do with my father and then uh, what I lived through when I was pastoring in Virginia. When I grew up, in, I, grew, I was born and raised in Chicago. My father was of Colombian descent. My mother was born and raised in Chicago, got saved, got the Holy Ghost, and went to Columbia as a missionary, and that's where she met my dad, and they got married, and their plan was to live in South America the rest of their lives, but as um, drug trafficking became, came to prominence in the 70s out of, uh, for the safety of my mother's life, really, they left Columbia to, um, temp, you know, they were just going to wait it out. Well, you know, my father passed away five years ago waiting it out. I mean, they were, you know, <laughs> they brought them 
you know, with a plan. They thought it was to wait it out. My dad ended up planting one church that turned into 38 churches and wow. was uh, in his own right responsible for spreading the Pentecostal message in Spanish around most of uh, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and Anyhow, and your but, mother just returned back, didn't, didn't? Yeah, my mom just went back to the mission field. She's in Guatemala right now, actually quarantined there right now while we're here. But my growing up in that church, um, my father's ministry really reached into the first generation immigrant community, and so I remember growing up and seeing my father do citizenship seminars and helping people buy their first car, uh -huh. buy their first house. And he was assimilating people into two kingdoms. He was assimilating people into the kingdom of heaven, but also assimilating them as citizens of the United States and teaching very practical things. We did seminars on how to balance a checkbook, how to buy a car. I can't tell you how many car dealerships I fell asleep in the lobby of while my dad was helping a single mom or a family buy their very first car and negotiating those car deals for them or helping somebody buy their first house. And so to me, that's what a pastor did. My yeah. dad was a true, in, in, in essence, he was a spiritual father to these people because they were, at least in the context of living here, were fatherless. And so they looked to my dad for that. And so I thought that was just normal. I thought that's what you did. I remember my father bailing people out of jail, people that he loved, you know, people that were members of the church got in a little trouble, but it was my dad that was there at midnight paying the fee to get them out and different things. And so when I, um, you know, I helped my dad when I, when I moved to Virginia, my thought was I'm an evangelist. I'm going to be here two years, go home to Chicago, take, you know, work with my dad in a transition plan. Little did I know I was going to start pastoring there. This is around 2005. But as we grew our, uh, this first church, the Lord led me in that same way. Um, I, I was, it was predominantly first generation church, 67% undocumented immigrant. And, my, and I found myself doing immigration seminars, citizenship seminars, helping people how you do this, how you do that. And I saw there was, a, there, there was a, an issue that happened in Virginia Beach in 2007 where a drunk driver, a, a Hispanic drunk driver, killed an Anglo young lady. And it was a horrible thing. And the man was completely at fault. But there was a shift in the narrative. Uh, against the Hispanic community there for a time. And I, so I was living, I was pastoring in it. And all I knew to do was to kind of go back to my roots of what I saw my dad do. So I got involved, not because I wanted to be political. I wanted to help the situation. And through that, I, you know, was told about Sam Rodriguez. And, you know, I preached for a, a lady in Virginia Beach named uh, Bishop Ann Jimenez from the Rock Church. And she said, do you know Sam Rodriguez? I said, I don't. She said, well, you're supposed to be connected to him. And so I met him and it just blossomed from there. But again, all of those roots really go back to what I saw my father do in the 80s and in the early 90s as, and you know, the thing is that, and, and again, it's in a, a different context for pastors that are watching according to the cultures that you pastor. But what I really saw from my father is that as he sowed into the people, he was sowing into their future. So you yeah. could take a painter that was making minimum wage in the 80s and spend time in, you know, developing that person and working with that person, applying the whole gospel. If the holistic gospel is applied yeah. to your life, it changes everything about you, your money, your education, your family, your marriage, etc. So that painter that was making minimal money as a laborer five years later was owning the paint company yeah. and by owning the paint company they no longer live in apartments they live in houses and by not living in apartments they're no longer transient people but they're permanent people which now you can build foundations so i learned those principles from my dad and um and and, and again you know he passed away five years ago but he was a man you know lived in dirt floors the second oldest of 13 he came to the U.S. with absolutely nothing, got a job making $4 an hour, shoveling snow at a bank in Chicago, ended up being the vice president of the bank, opened all these churches, and he did it without more than maybe a freshman year's uh, high school education, if that. But he showed that hard work and being self, that if you'd have the discipline of hard work and, and to, to, to be self-taught, that education doesn't end in the classroom. Education you know, every book you can get your hands on, you read it, every seminar you can go. And I watched a man that most of society would say, he's not going to amount to anything, turned out to be the greatest hero and example I've ever had in my life. Well, that's incredible. 
And uh, I want to I want to say at this point for those of you that um, watch this uh, watch this episode of Forward Talk, please take the opportunity to go subscribe to Pastor Suarez's uh, social media. I believe you are on Twitter uh, and Instagram for sure. I'm not. I don't know if you're on Facebook as well. Yeah, we're mainly yeah we're mainly on Instagram and Facebook at Pastor Tony Suarez. Only go to Twitter if you want the political stuff, but uh, Instagram. And go for the political stuff. If you are at all political, you definitely want to uh, <laughs> engage in, in Tony's uh, perspective on uh, cultural politics. And so on it, Twitter, it's Rev Tony Suarez, but Instagram and Facebook is where we post our well, daily blogs. We do a daily devotional every morning, and that's at Pastor Tony Suarez. My, my uh, producer is going to uh, put all of your. Uh, social media handles on the in Lowell thirds. It will all be there for them to uh, make available. And of course, if uh, you are watching this and you happen to not be subscribed to forward talk, please take the opportunity to subscribe, hit the notification bell and uh, stay engaged with forward talk. Uh, man, thank you so much for, <clears throat> thank you so much for doing this. I want to shift gears now just a little bit. Mm -hmm. And let's let's kind of put a face on uh, that kind of that intersectionality between uh, between uh, church and culture, which, mm -hmm. if done right, the two of them can never never be separated. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, too often, we Pentecostals have preached such a message of separation that that we we separate from the world so much that anything that happens in the world is irrelevant to us as, as Christians. And of course that has to change. Um, <clears throat> we, we are of course, uh, in a season right now where many of us are quarantined due to COVID-19 and, uh, the pandemic that's, that's spread across the world. And of course there has been a number of churches that have, that have been affected by the quarantine, of course, on a very practical level, it's affected how people go to church, et cetera. But in the news, there have been a couple, I can think of three cases that I've, I've seen in the news where uh, local municipalities, sheriff's offices have intervened in, uh, on, on several different levels and how local churches uh, have, have church. One of them that was the case in Mississippi where, um, uh, a Baptist pastor was preaching to his congregation. They were sitting in the in the parking lots. All of them had their windows rolled up. Uh, they were all in their cars. No one were, was out of their cars. And local sheriff's deputies were going from car to car and writing five hundred dollars tickets to everyone that was sitting in that in that parking lot. Of course, there was the case of the church in in Florida where the pastor was arrested for having services. And probably the face of all of this right now in the national and public news is Pastor uh, Tony Spell in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, and I'm going to ask a series of follow-up questions after you give your initial thoughts. Sure. But can, can you um, kind of give some initial, um, what your initial impression is about the role of, of government in this area and, and how far churches should go to in complying with these types of regulations and how religious freedom and these kind of things interact in, in today's culture. Yeah. So to, to put it, so thank you for the question. I love the question because right now this is probably, you know, in my top three things that I'm most passionate about <clears throat> to put it into context, I have to go back to my family history just a little bit. My family came into the gospel in 1952 in Colombia, and at the time, you can, as Pastor Sam would say, do your Google due diligence. If you study the history of the country of Colombia in the 50s, the president of Colombia was determined to eradicate Colombia of evangelicalism, specifically Pentecost Pentecostalism. And so there was a government sanctioned attack to not just eradicate, meaning kill the doctrine, but kill like actually kill, murder Protestant ministers, specifically Pentecostals. And so there was a movement. It was, it was authorized by the president of Columbia at the time. We're going to eradicate our country of evangelicals. And so my grandfather's water well was poisoned. I've preached about this story. Um, his neighbor named Don Tulio 
poisoned the water well to kill the Suarez family rather than die. They became healthier and they actually ended up leading Don Tulio to the Lord. Don Tulio was martyred for being a gospel preacher. My father was stoned, and I don't mean, you know, stoned. I mean, like, <laughs> thrown into the rocks, stoned at my father in the city of Bucaramanga for preaching the gospel. He was left for dead on a city corner. This gospel cost us everything. It almost cost us my family's life, including my own father. And so my father always warned me that a day would come when they take away our Bibles. He also told me that a day would come when they try to shut down our churches. My father was very, very passionate. About Bibles. He was very passionate about church services and not uh, not forsaking the assembling, if you will. So I've always yeah. had that ingrained in my mind. So when quarantine first started, I was one of those people very concerned about what was going on. And then again, we saw the church re and, and I hate to use the word re reinvent itself. Yeah. But what I think we did was that we accommodated in a good way. Um, yeah. We shifted. We, we figured out a way to not forsake the assembling of ourselves. We went digital. Yeah. We went to drive-in services. We did those things. We were good neighbors to our community. We, kept, we practiced social distancing. We took the virus as a real thing. Um, we, we understood all of those things, and, and we, we tried to do our best. My concern, and here, again, this is just me. I didn't say I'm right, and say I, maybe I'm wrong. This is just yeah. me. My concern is the government, and, and the federal government never did it. My concern is local government putting rules or their own interpretation slash spin on the Constitution telling us, no, you can't have a drive-in service because that violates, uh, that violates self-quarantine. Well, I've sat in lines for 20 minutes at Starbucks. Yeah. I sat in the line the other day. Gina wanted to get all the kids and get out when we went to Dairy yeah. Queen. Yeah. We sat in that line at Dairy Queen for over 30 minutes, and there was no issue. There was no whatever. And then we, we parked our car in the parking lot at Dairy Queen. And, and sat there for, yeah. yeah. No, and nobody said anything. But you're telling me that if I go to church and I sit in the parking lot with the windows rolled up, that somehow I'm violating uh, some kind of made-up law or I'm going to spread the disease? That's where my issue is. Because Absolutely. Because you're telling people they – if you're allowing people, again, you know, in the land of the free, if you're allowing people to go through a drive through at McDonald's, but you won't let them drive through the church for prayer, and the people at church have masks on and gloves on and sanitation stations, and you're not even rolling down the windows, I mean, come on. My Maybe God, they're not even doing it. Yesterday, and when the lady hand me, handed me the bag, our hands touched, not on purpose, but they did. Yeah. So that's where my issue and my concern is. Rodney Howard Brown said, and he was the pastor that was arrested in Florida. He said, yeah. and others said, if you give them, if you give an inch, you're never going to get it back. That's and exactly what right. Was how local counties, some overzealous counties saw what happened in Florida and they took it one step further. Now it's not, we, you can't have church in the sanctuary. Now they're saying you can't. There are counties. I mean, this is happening in Jackson County, Missouri. This is happening in central Illinois right now. I have a friend that pastors in central Illinois that's having an issue. Uh, my, I have family in Chicago that are having issues and in other parts of the country where even a drive-in or drive-through service is being scrutinized. We had Mendocino County, I believe that's the pronunciation of it, in California that temporarily banned singing from online services because they said coronavirus is spread through the air. So they said, you can't sing on your online, on your online service. I mean, this is got, it's getting crazy. So thank God that we have a wonderful, wonderful man in government named William Barr. And if you read the article yesterday, yeah. he ordered legal action against governors that infringe on civil rights, specifically religious rights. So the federal government is trying to do what they can to, to, to bring a little sense of normalcy, but I would encourage those watching, uh, there's two websites I'd give you, www.lc.org or reopenchurch.org. And both of those are run by the Liberty Council. Matt Staver is probably the foremost religious liberty attorney in the country. He argues and wins in front of the Supreme Court. And uh, I held a conference call with him yesterday um, he'll help. Again, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't explain all of the nuances of the law, but Matt and his team 
can, uh, they on their website just have a plethora of information to help you know what your legal rights are. What's yeah. the difference between what a county says versus what the governor says and what the federal mandate says? And at the end of the day, remember that we're governed by the United States Constitution, not your county's interpretation of the Constitution. That's right. But the United States Constitution. And when it comes to Pastor Spell, there is probably nothing more polarizing to talk about right now. There's nothing that'll get more hate messages on my Facebook page than me supporting Pastor Spell. But yeah. here's the deal. Whether you agree or disagree with his brand of, of Christianity, whether you agree or disagree with what he is doing, I agree with his right to freedom of religion. Yes. I, I lived in Virginia Beach for 15 years. Um, I lived at, not too far from the place that's called First Landing. That's where the settlers, now people in, in you know, St. Augustine, Florida, will argue a little bit with this, but there's a little debate with them. But the first settlers came to Jamestown. They came to First Landing. They came to Virginia Beach. Now, again, St. Augustine says they went there first. I don't know. But whether it was the first or the second, they came to this area called First Landing. And before the settlers got off the boats, they prayed and fasted for three days on those boats. They, and, and now remember, why did the settlers come? They came for freedom of religion, freedom of enterprise, freedom of speech. They came for freedom. Yeah. They prayed and fasted for three days on those boats. And when they came off of the boats, they anointed the beach of, of First Landing. They anointed Virginia Beach. They planted a cross and they dedicated the land to the evangelization of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They made a covenant with God and the land. That's how this started. And so yeah. for me, it's shocking that 400 years later, we would try to limit someone's uh, expression of worship or, or, or if they, if again, whether you think it's wise or unwise to publicly gather, I was going to say the exact same thing. Wisdom, the wisdom of what Tony Spell is doing aside, totally, as, and, the, and even the wisdom of how he has handled all the situations, which I think he could have done better at handling in certain situations. All of that aside, the right to assemble, the right to have church is, to me, of, of prime importance um, in this particular situation. I'm to, and now, again, some of the things I'll say might generate an eye roll from some, but just, I, I, you know, we're cooking a whole lot more than what we, you know, we normally cook. So I'm in the grocery store a lot more often than I normally go. Yeah. I have not worn a mask one time. I, I have seen people cough and sneeze. And they do the, you know, they do all that stuff. But I'm saying they're touching the same cereal boxes I'm touching. That's right. They're going through the same produce I'm touching and going through. We're using the same cash registers and nobody's wiping down the cash register from one customer to the next. Uh, if, if you can go to the grocery store, okay, if you're, if you're gonna take the risk of going to the grocery store or anywhere else you're going, then I, I don't, I, I have, again, it's my own interpretation, but I don't, I don't see what the issue is. And again, especially if somebody wants to do it, that is, that's their decision. What's interesting to me specifically in the, in the, uh, the, the issue in Louisiana is that they're only picking on pastor spell. Why are they not coming after the entire group, the entire, you know, like everybody there? Why, yeah. you know, we, like we have, I have a friend that pastors in Kansas and his entire church has been threatened and they're not doing physical uh, or, or in-person gatherings. They're, they're doing drive-in services. But the sheriff said, if you have another drive-in service, everybody is getting a ticket. That's what happened in Mississippi before, you know, uh, uh, William Barr stepped in. Yeah. So my point is, why, why in Louisiana specifically, why are they only picking on Pastor Spell? Yeah. Why? And, and again, you have to, you got to, if, 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 every, if all those people are coming and gathering in those services, why isn't everybody culpable? Why isn't there why isn't the threat? Why, why isn't there ankle bracelets on everybody? Why doesn't the judge put ankle bracelets on the musicians and the praise singers and the ushers and the attorneys? Why only pastor spell? And yeah. that's where it seems to me, and I'm going to be very careful with these words, but that's to me where it seems like a personal uh, vendetta or persecution 
of Pastor Spell. Again, whether you agree or disagree with everything he's doing, yeah. why are they only focusing on Pastor Spell? And you say, well, he's the pastor. Well, yeah. but everybody that's coming to that service technically is violating whatever the stay at home order. Yeah. yeah. So why not? I mean, why not come after why not come after everybody? So that's where I stand with Pastor Spell. I never thought I would live to see the day where a pastor was being uh, fitted for an ankle bracelet. Yeah. And, I under, and again, I understand that there's other issues that have now become involved and some say it's, you know, well, he did something else. Well, yeah. we used to say you're innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. Okay. Yeah. So let Pastor Spell have his day in court to defend himself over the, that accusation that this other person made of, you know, with yeah. the bus incident. Give him, but why, why is the order... It, it, when it comes to the bus incident, what does it have to do with preaching? Why did the judge take that and yeah. turn the orders of house arrest to say you can't preach? I, I yeah. mean, because because it lets you know. I think that they were waiting for any uh, little thing that they could to make it about him preaching because that's what it's been about the whole time. And now, and so you know, they had a rally yesterday and. Uh, I'm told that, you know, there's, I don't know, over a thousand people that showed up. I don't know the exact number, but I heard they had a lot of people that showed up there. Um, I don't think the rally was broken up. I don't think the police threatened anybody there. No, they didn't. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I just, I just don't understand. Um, yeah, it, they, it seems really personal down there and there's nothing good that can come out of that. So I hear, and again, I'm not, I hear the judge, um, said, I won't hear anything else against Pastor Spell, you know, until the courts open up. I think that's, you know, it, it seems, and again, I'm not involved in every detail of the case, but it seems like a goodwill gesture on their yeah. end. So, um, you know, we'll see, we'll see how it, you know, but we'll see how it all works out. But I think that every pastor, every preacher ought to view the case and think about yourself because here's, here's the deal to me. We've always been taught to have vision. You got to have short-term, uh, short-term, mid-term, long-term vision. Okay, so when like when I was pastoring a church, um, you you know I I know it's unwise to compare yourself, but you also have to be able to you know are you being successful? So I had contemporaries, I had peers that were at the same part of ministry, you know, same point of ministry as I was, that I could look to see what they're doing and and compare it to what I was doing, and that would give me a little indication of where we were, and then. There was those churches that were 20 years ahead that I'd look to as well to kind of give me a long-term vision. And I also would look at those that were five or 10 years ahead to give me kind of, okay, this is, this is maybe next steps for us. So in that, in that uh, analogy, looking eight years down the road, okay, or four years down the road to the next election, okay, after 2020. Yes. I don't know who comes into power. I don't know who your next governor is. I don't know who your next county board uh, president is, okay? But if we don't take a stand now, it's not right now so much that concerns me. It's what is coming down the road. Yeah. Because if they could shut down the Christian church, okay? Now, somebody looked in the, you know, the, the camera and said, oh, they didn't shut us down. We had, we had Facebook church. That's fine. But you don't know what four years down the road looks like. You don't know what eight years down the road looks like. But, because so it's, 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 definitely, it's definitely told a future progressive uh, authoritarian leftist uh, yes. presidential candidate that all you have to do is make a health emergency out of this and the American church will roll it's, over it's for you. It's wicked administrations that could be down the road that concern me and, and government and things like what is happening in California. Where they're, where they're trying to dictate what you can preach or not teach, teach or not teach. So what happens down the road when they say, all right, you have to go to internet services, but you can't teach about X, Y, Z. That we, if we don't stand for our liberties now, yeah. we're not going to have them in the future. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to say this just for uh, a, a little bit of perspective and balance. There are, in terms of, of, of theological uh, positions and things of that nature. Pastor Spell and I disagree on a whole host of things. That's beside the point. I think that personally he could have, he could have handled a number of situations better than what he has. And that's beside the point. I'm with you, man. It's, 
it's something chilling. And even people who 100%, I have a, uh, a gentleman here locally that I've talked to. He is 1000% opposed to Tony meeting and having church. But at the same time, the image of anybody being arrested for preaching, regardless of why, is has a, an amazing chilling effect on the soul if you have any conscience whatsoever toward religious liberty and, and religious freedom. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, even Rodney Howard Brown was arrested. And then two days later, the governor took an executive order or, or made an executive order that said that there, that there was no there was no prohibition, if you will, on, yeah. on church. The church is an essential service. So technically, Rodney Howard Brown could go back to having church right now. The river could yeah. have services. They received, the last time I talked to Dr. Brown, they had received over 80,000 death threats. So to protect his people, yeah. he has not gone back to physical or in-person gatherings, but it was to protect his people because of the amount of death threats. But think of that. You're getting death threats because you had church you had church. We, this is supposed to be a land of freedom of speech, freedom of enterprise, and freedom of religion. And freedom I mean, of assembly. You don't even have to agree with your religion. No. But you have the freedom to, 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 to express your public worship. Of, you know, and again, I have friends that completely disagree with what I'm saying right now. But you, again, if you had the context of what I heard in some of the countries I've preached in and the people, you know, I, I do a lot of work with the persecuted church under the radar, nothing public because you can't really talk about it. You can't yeah. name the people, but goodness gracious, they, they tell me, Tony, you have to protect the faith, you know, because there was a day where we had the freedom to preach. There was a day we, and, and, and we lost it. And so there's, I, I just, you know, the U S is, is blessed because we, you know, we've been that missionary center of taking yeah. the gospel around the world. There's nothing that I think the enemy would like greater to do in the U S than to clamp down on that. Stop yeah. the evangelization of the world. The only thing between us and the enemy being sentenced to the lake of fire to his, you know, eternal yeah. and final uh, conviction is Matthew 24. When the gospel is preached to every nation, then the end will come. He's delaying. He doesn't want the gospel to go to every ends of the earth, but look what God's doing in it, even in quarantine. We have inundated every medium of media with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and here locally, just from our church, man, we have people watching our live stream that has never engaged with our church before. We have people reaching out to us on Facebook Messenger uh, that's telling us as soon as this is over, we're, we're going to be in your church. We're going to come worship with you. And it, it's been amazing how we are reaching and touching people in our community that we that we never have before. And man, I completely understand the uh, the the position of wanting to handle things wisely, wanting to uh, as much as possible comply with health orders and things of that nature. But the question becomes: How long? How far? What what if this continues to be? as some governors are wanting to do to, to push this out for months at a time. I mean, at what point, at what point do we say, no, this, this is enough. We, we are, we're going to have church and. And you can do it and, and have church and, and, and practice social distancing and yeah. set up hand sanitizing stations. And um, like I said, on those have, websites, even have a go to multiple services so that the crowding in the building isn't as. Yeah, and, and have family units sit together and then, you know, move a few chairs. There, there's ways to do this, but here's, here's my, what I would admonish the spirit filled Pentecostal church. We were, we were the, the ugly step cousin <laughs> of the body of Christ for many years. Um, and, and we wanted to come into prominence. We wanted to be accepted by, you know, the, the fullness of the evangelical family. And so we've polished our image and, and all of that. But some people, some, it seems that for the sake of political expediency, to be yeah. accepted at the table, we're trying to water down. I mean, uh, Pentecostals were never 
We, we, we were never fully accepted, if you will. I yeah. mean, we believe in, in the power of prayer. We believe in healing and the gifts of the Spirit. We believe and, in speaking in tongues and miracles and the supernatural and the and mainstream not, culture. I wasn't, now you, and so someone says, but Suarez, you got involved in, in politics. Yeah, but I didn't cave in on the Pentecostal message. I didn't cave in on signs, miracles, and wonders. And what I'm saying to you, or, or what, not to you personally, Brother Carroll, yeah. but just to, the, to those that are watching is, don't fall into some kind of rut where you're just doing things so that you're accepted politically that is contrary to your faith. Now, yeah. I don't think you need to put yourself necessarily in harm's way just to prove a point, okay? I'm not and saying you go dance with snakes just to prove that the snake's not gonna hurt you. Yeah. But what I am saying, is at some point this world needs healing and we know a power we know a name we know an authority they, they haven't found a vaccine but i know a name that you can call that can yes. eradicate COVID 19. i mean yes. we, we we need to still believe that while the world is still seeking a remedy we still believe in the power of prayer and the power of hope and i want us to be careful because i think there are some that are going to disqualify themselves from being able to talk about faith, hope, and miracles. There's some people that it's going to be really hard for me to hear them talk about the gifts of the Spirit after the way they acted during quarantine. Yeah. And so you got to be responsible. Brother uh, Morton Buster, mentor in my life. I talk to Brother Buster every day. He said, Tony, I've heard him since I was 17 years old. Tony, we need to raise up pragmatic, prophetic people. That means you're not either or, you're both and. Oh, yes. Be practical and be prophetic. You can wash your hands and pray the prayer of faith. You don't have to be so crazy that you, you know, you, you, you know, you, you say here, cough on the orange and then you eat it just to prove yeah, something. Exactly. Be, pra be practical, but we have to still be prophetic people. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we shouldn't unnecessarily be obnoxious and, and poke our finger in the eye of government and all of that stuff. But at, at some point, Man, we have to be the kingdom of God. Yeah, we yeah. have to be salt and light at some point. And I don't know where all the lines are. I just think at that in many cases that we are getting. Uh, well, let me just say it like this: I think in in a good number of cases that local mu municipalities have created massive overreach and how they're imposing restrictions. And uh, more times than not lately, they're losing the case. So if are. you're a local pastor that's facing that kind of thing, like I said, and I, I look, I have nothing to gain or lose. Uh, when I mentioned Matt Staver, I don't profit off of that. It's just, yeah. uh, it's just someone that I, I know is tackling the issue. And it, there's other attorneys you can talk to. Yeah. But what I'm telling you is if you stand for your rights, especially on these orders that are coming forward, uh, they're not going to win. You're going to win. So stand, stand for your faith and don't cave in. The bar article was was awesome that I just read in the last mm -hmm. day or so. Um, it, that that's that's pretty incredible. And now we're going to shift to something just a little bit less controversial. I want you to talk about your book, uh, the Triumphant Church. I have uh, over the last couple of days read the first three or four chapters um, of your book. It's fantastic. Um, it's it's a, it's wonderful. I've been encouraged. I've been uh, strengthened uh, spiritually from from reading your book, and flowing from that, I want you to talk of just a little bit, tagging into what you already said about the whole idea of the supernatural, the miraculous, uh, and how you see the uh, how you see the kingdom of God, how you see uh, the triumphant church. I was pastoring in Virginia. We had gone through a church split. I was feeling like a loser. Um, any pastor that's ever lived through that, you just know the feelings that come. You know, you, you, get, you get angry, you're hurt, you're sad. Um, and I was going through that. And so I did, you know, what us Pentecostals do, can't go to the bar. So I went to camp meeting. That's where we go get our rehab. And so I went to camp meeting and the man preaching that night said, there's a pastor in this room who's struggling You've gone through loss, you've gone whatever, you know, I'm, I'm raising my hand, ugly cry face. And he said, God told me to pray <laughs> to tell you that. Raise your voice and say, oh God, give me a book of Acts, church. And so I did it like right straight up in camp meeting. I'm just throwing my hands up, oh God, give me. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, have you read the book of Acts? And I'm like, 
you know, Lord, I'm, I'm Pentecostal. It's like the only book I read in the Bible. You know, <laughs> you know, I make my jokes that sometimes offend people, but I, it, it, but it's a joke. I said, yeah. I told somebody, I said that one time I backslid and bought a lottery ticket. I didn't know what numbers to play, but I played two thirty eight because the number I know. So, uh, it's, of course, I mean, I, I I felt like I should know the Book of Acts, but it, the Lord, it, it's almost like going to the eye doctor and um, you, what, what I, I, have, I have a wonderful eye doctor. I've gone to the same eye doctor for like 17 years, but she's very dramatic. When she puts those lenses in front of you, she put them on and she'll say one, two. And I mean, she's very dramatic with the numbers and we'll get, I'll think, I, I think the number's right. I'll say two. And then right when we get it, she'll be like three. I'm like, oh, come on. I just told you two. And then she hits four. I'm like, oh yeah, four. Well, it's like the Holy Spirit took my glasses off and put these lenses in front of me and said, I'm going to show you something. You thought you had 20-20 vision. Let me show you something you never saw before. And so I started reading through the book of Acts, and I didn't see anything good. All I saw was the bad. Yeah. Acts chapter 1, they don't know how to wait on the promise of the Father. Jesus has commanded them to wait. And while they're waiting around, they start naming leaders. They name, you know, Matthias, probably a good guy. You never read about him again. So they're making, they're making decisions outside of the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit falls. They're immediately made mockery of in Jerusalem, which means they're already irrelevant. Acts chapter 3, Peter and John go to church. There's a lame man at the door who needs money. And turns out the ministry is already broke. It's only the third chapter. Peter and John said, silver and gold have we none. So they already are, uh, you know, a, a poor ministry looking for a, you know, PPP loan. And then you get, to <laughs> Acts <chapter four. laughs> you get to Acts chapter four and they preach so good. They get to spend the, their honorarium for preaching and, you know, their accommodations as they get to spend the night in prison. Acts chapter five, Ananias and Sapphira lie to the man of God. They lie to the Holy Ghost and they drop dead in church. Could you imagine uh, for those of you that, you know, like our service leaders, could you imagine when you're doing your whole, welcome to our church, we're so glad to have you here. If you're a first time guest, would you raise your hand here, t-shirt can, here, take our, t our church t-shirt, we're so happy to have you here today. Welcome, listen, here's a coupon to get free coffee, have, you know, feel at home today, all we ask is don't lie, because if you lie, you will die today. I mean, <laughs> essentially what happens, so you got people dropping dead, you got a broke ministry, Acts chapter 6, they're, they're blessed. Now they're so blessed that they're highly favored. They're so blessed that there's no stress and they're blessed coming in. And you would think that now that they're blessed, they would be happy. But it turns out you can be so blessed that you're spoiled because now they're complaining about who gets chicken first. And so now you've got conflict in the church because they're blessed. Acts chapter 7, Stephen's being put to death. Acts chapter 8, Simon the sorcerer sees that by the laying on of hands, people get the Holy Ghost. And he goes, how much is that? Now you've got corruption in the church. Acts chapter 9, the church rejects Saul of Tarsus. They can't believe that he got saved. And now we got a legalistic church that thinks that God only saved some, but he can't save all. And then in Acts chapter 10, Jesus tells Peter, go preach to Cornelius' house. And Jesus and Peter says, mm -mm, I don't preach to those people. And you got segregation. And it's only the 10th chapter of the book of Acts. And at that point, I closed my Bible and I said, no way. I don't need a book of Acts church. Give me Laodicea. I know you can spit it out, but at least it made it in your mouth. And you read the rest of the book of Acts. There's more stuff. I mean, my God, the book ends in a shipwreck. There's that part where the apostles preaching and you got young people falling out of windows and dropping dead. All the old timers thought it was, it, this is great church. Man, he's a preacher real good. But the young people are falling asleep. It's irrelevant. You know, you know why his name is Eutychus, right? Why is that? Eutychus too, if you'd fill out that window. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you got people falling out of windows. And I mean, the book of Acts has a lot of drama. And then I went back and I read it and I saw all the blessing, all the miracles. Almost every chapter of the book of Acts has drama, persecution, corruption, lying, murder, deceit, all kinds. But every chapter has signs, miracles, wonders, growth, evangelization. And what it let me know is there is nothing that the 21st century church is facing that the first century church didn't have to fight through as well. Amen. So when you say, oh, we want to be like the first century church, we are like the first century church. We're dealing with corruption. We're dealing with promiscuity. We're dealing with issues in the home. We're dealing with that, that battle of blending be, or, or, or merging of generations and passing the baton. All The first century church dealt with with all of that, but it did not negate that there was signs, miracles, and wonders. There was a move of the Holy Spirit that because, and, and so then you have to analyze what 
What was it about that first century church that could that they could be, you know, spend a night in jail and then go see 5,000 people healed the next day? And that's what you got to look for. What were, what were the ingredients of the book of Acts that made them a triumphant church? Well, number one, we're predicated on the promise. Jesus said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. And there's no disclaimer there. No. Secondly, it's what, what, did, what were they given to? They were given to prayer. They were given to being led and being full of the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and anyhow, there's my, if I keep talking, you won't need to buy the book because I just told you the book. But the point is, for the last 21 centuries, this has been a triumphant church. And yeah. for the last 21 centuries, every century has predicted that the church is about to be annihilated and come to an end. And every doomsday prophet has been wrong. And I submit to you, that every critic of the modern church that feels like this thing is about to fall apart is wrong. Yep. Jesus could have given this last day revival to any major, and I won't even name names to not offend, but whoever you think are the generals of the faith from days gone by, he could have given the last day church to any of those generals, but he didn't. He waited till John Carroll and Tony Suarez and our children were on the scene. And that yeah. lets me know and, and no presumptuous, you know, uh, meaning by this. But it lets me know that Jesus trusts us. And yeah. he trusts our kids with the church. Because if he did it, he wouldn't have let them have it. Man. So Jesus trusts this generation with the church. Who are we to say that this generation is going to mess it up? No, Jesus let us be alive for such a time as this. And if Jesus trusts us, then we need to trust this generation with his church. One of the most memorable quotes out of all the books that I've read, and I've read a stack of them, is I believe his name was Osborne. Last name was Osborne, but it's, it's in the book, uh, Accidental Pharisees. Mm. And he makes, the, he makes the statement that God has always drawn straight lines with crooked sticks. Ah. And so his point was is that God has always used imperfect people to accomplish his, his perfect will. And, and this generation is going to be no different than every other generation that's preceded us. None of us have it all together. None of us uh, are perfect, but God is going to use crooked sticks to draw a straight line in the world. I love that. I love that. I'm writing that down while you're saying it. That's beautiful. <laughs> God is going to use uh, the crooked sticks of the 21st century to, to accomplish his perfect, perfect will in the world. And we will have links uh, for your book in uh, okay. the notes of this episode. We'll also put a cool little graphic of the cover of your book on the we screen. So everybody will, everybody will know where, uh, what to look for. It's, it's an, it's an incredible book. One more thing before we are done. Uh, you told a story. Uh, you told a story when I heard you preach recently in Nashville. Um, and hopefully this small detail will uh, trigger your memory about it. And I want you to tell uh, our audience today uh, about those, I believe it was, were Chinese people that were wanting that fire book. Yeah. Well, you know, the, and again, this is, this is really what eats at me. And, um, you know, I, I, I in, in, in that sermon, I think I, I, I'm pretty sure I said, I will, I, I no longer will argue doctrine yeah. with anybody. Um, thanks, thanks be to God for the theologians that defend sound doctrine. We need that. But God didn't give me this book to argue and fight with other believers. He gave me this book to preach it to those that don't know so that they might believe. Yeah. And there is, there's a translation of the Bible. It's called the Fire Bible that um, was, you know, printed in mass and it was taken to, to China. But, you know, rather than write Holy Bible on the front of it or whatever, there's just a flame. And it started, be, that's actually where it got its name. It was never supposed to be called the Fire Bible. But the yeah. Chinese people, it's just like a green plastic cover, if you will. And people started saying, I want the Fire Book, the Fire Book, or, or the Fire Bible. <laughs> and that's where it got its name. And people, you know, just holding on to that word. There's, there are, it just, it eats at me. Brother Carol, there are 3,000 language groups today that don't have a Bible translated into their language. Yeah. While we argue over semantics, 
We, over, we argue over personal preferences and, and not making light of that. It's okay if you have a preference, that's fine. I'm not attacking you for that. But we're arguing amongst ourselves when there's so many that don't know. There's people that, there are millions of people that, have, that they don't know the name of Jesus. They don't know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. They don't know those things. So I just, my, I don't want to spend more time arguing. I want to spend time getting this Bible into the hands of as many people as I can. We've worked with a group called Voice of the Martyr to get Bibles into North Korea, um, get Bibles into China, to get that fire Bible, to get, you know, they're hiding it. Sometimes they hide it in fields so that somebody else can pick it up and they just, they kind of just leave it because the government doesn't, it doesn't say Holy Bible. The government's not necessarily looking for it, but it's the, the people kind of like, you know, first century Christians, they would write, they would draw the, the fish in the sand yeah. and that's how you identify that green cover. It's kind of like you, people know if you find the green covered book, that's the Bible. That's and one of the, the coolest things I heard uh, from some of the contacts over there is that the, uh, some of these believers have, t um, they, you know, they, they've purchased uh, airtime on radio stations and they're not telling anybody what they're doing. They've just started reading the Bible. <clears throat> but they're not saying book of Proverbs chapter 12, da, 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 whatever. They're just reading it. And it sounds like they're reading poetry. So people think that they're just hearing poetry. And this is, this not, I, 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 I have not met the man personally. Okay, I, I, have not, I don't live in China. I can't say I've met the man personally. But this is the testimony that was told to me. They were reading the book of James on the radio. They read James chapter 5. If there be any sick amongst you, let them call for the, oil, for the elders, anointing uh, with oil and the prayer of the sick, you know, uh, prayer of faith will save, you know. Okay, <clears throat> a man called into the radio station, and he said, I so enjoyed the poem you read yesterday about the <laughs> And he said, I have a water buffalo. Again, I've never met the man. I don't have a picture of his water buffalo. But he <laughs> said, I have a water buffalo that's been very ill. And I thought, you know what? That poem is so inspiring. I wonder if it actually works. And he anointed his water buffalo, and he prayed the prayer of faith. Okay? I can't tell you his exact verbiage, but his testimony was that God healed the water buffalo. <laughs> and, and so... It's, it's crazy things like that that almost sound so far-fetched to believe that is happening. And so now what happened is they've started talking about salvation. And yeah. this is what they've had to do in China, whether you agree or disagree with this. What do you do when you can't get to the people? Okay, what do you do when you're under national government enforced with the penalty of death quarantine? Yeah. Okay? They have told people. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and you've prayed and you've repented of your sins, find a pool of water, whether that's a lake, an ocean, a river, or something in your home, and walk into the water and immerse yourself and say, Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. And they have reports of tens of thousands of people that are self-baptizing themselves because a preacher can't get to them. That's yeah. the power of this gospel. And that's why I am convinced that this is still a triumphant church. I'm not worried about the yeah. future of the church as long as we keep preaching this message. God will not let, he will not let this church become a defeated, lukewarm, laying in a fetal position church. We will not let it happen. We will continue to be a triumphant church. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. And uh, um, there, there, there are some of us in the body of Christ, though, that do love theology. And I Amen. saw... And I saw and I saw your, uh, on your bio that you did some work with Regent University, and I am currently uh, working on uh, my theology degree at Regent. Amen. And, this is uh, incredible. And, and, and so let me clarify. I think oh, we should. I, I know exactly what. I, yeah, we need to defend the faith. We just, I just don't want to spend my life in endless debates over the same absolutely. thing, the same thing with the same people. Absolutely. That's exactly right. And I agree with that completely, that at some point fighting with the same people over and over and over about the same issues uh, benefits absolutely, absolutely no one. Mm -hmm. It does nothing to, uh, but to produce sex of, of division within the body of Christ, yeah. and it's unfruitful and unproductive. But I am, um, I am going to be doing a master's in uh, 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 MTS, a master's in theological studies with a major in biblical languages 
I'm not sure where I'm going to do my doctoral program yet, but um, I saw that you had done some uh, work with Regent and absolutely. I've very much enjoyed my, my time there and uh, excited about finishing up my theology degree there. Yes, sir. They're wonderful people. And they were, they were a blessing to us while we were in Virginia. I want to do, I want to do some serious work in, um, in Greek uh, and, hopefully get to do some really cool things with, with biblical languages when I'm done. So I'm excited about that stuff. I think that's awesome. Man, Pastor Suarez, thank you so much for taking the time this morning to uh, join me for this conversation. I think that it has been um, uh, graceful. I think it's been life-giving. And everybody, please take the opportunity to go uh, buy Tony's book, The Triumphant Church. Again, the links will be in our in our uh, episode notes, um, take, take the time to, to purchase it, read it, and uh, let God encourage you that what you're a part of is, is something so big, so powerful, so wonderful, so grand, that the devil or nobody else is ever going to do anything to be able to stop it. Amen. Uh, as Pentecostals, we often quote Isaiah 9-6. What we very rarely quote is Isaiah 9-7. And Amen. of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Amen. And so we, we focus on 9-6. We rarely talk about 9-7, but 9-7 says that the kingdom of Messiah is an everlasting, ever-expanding kingdom. It's if believers will end. grasp that and read the book of Acts, we, I think for a long time we relegated the gifts of the Spirit, the moving of the Spirit, to just a select few. These are yep. the ones that are used. But if we will embrace true apostolic authority, that every believer can be used in the gifts of the spirit for the edification of the saints, for, you know, for the tearing down of strongholds so that people can be sick, healed and delivered. We'll no longer look at somebody that prays for the sick and say, Oh man, that's a prophet. No, they're, they're a believer. Yes, there's, exactly there are right. prophets, there are apostles, there are all of those things, but healing and the supernatural became such a relegated thing to a select few that if anybody did pray for the sick, we'd say, my God, that man is a prophet. There is a very well-known, and I'm not talking about Brother Buster, but there's another very well-known traveling ministry who's used in healing, and people call him a prophet, and he'd be the first one to tell you, I'm not a prophet. I'm yeah. an evangelist. I'm doing the work of an evangelist. And, he, and, and you know, there's, if we could empower the church to believe that again, that all of us could be used of God, Absolutely. And be used of the supernatural, then we could be the book of, the book of Acts church. Absolutely. Well, man, thank you again. And as I have been closing out all of my episodes of Forward Talk, I want to say thank you for joining with me in reversing the silence with Forward Talk. It's been a great time with you, uh, Pastor Suarez, and thank you again. Yes, for sir. Me.